Amen. This morning we're talking about abiding through pruning. And let's look at our scripture here this morning, John chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8, commonly known as the parable of the vine. Jesus said, I am the way, excuse me, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you desire, and it shall be done for you. But this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Uh, I've shared this a lot of times. Uh, A few years ago, my wife and I, we planted a small orchard with the idea that, you know, we wanted to have some of our own fruit trees, grow some apples, and we have some plums and pears and different things. And, uh, you know, I was naively, as, as my nature is, is to just jump before I study. And uh, so we planted this orchard thinking, well, you just plant the orchard and it grows fruit and that's what you get. You go out and pick the apples and so on. But obviously we were very naive And once the orchard began to grow, we soon found that orchards take a lot of work and fruit trees take a lot of care. And so what we found is um, you have to really maintain fruit trees. They really require a lot of vigilance, pruning, diligence, and care to keep insect infestation out of them, to keep them pruned properly. Because if you don't, they will just grow into big bushy trees that produce poor fruit and eventually you'll probably become diseased and die on you, a lot of them. And uh, one of the things I found about fruit trees that was quite interesting, and it gave me a lot of new insight into this particular passage of Scripture. Of course, Jesus here is talking about grapevines, but the principle is pretty much the same whether you're pruning a grapevine or a fruit tree. All trees, fruit tree, fruit-bearing trees, operate on the basically same principles. There's variations within them. There's a little bit of difference between a citrus fruit compared to like an apple tree or a plum tree and so on. But it's all basically the same principles. And Jesus here has given us this, this parable. And a parable is a, a physical, a natural story that teaches a spiritual truth. And of course, Jesus is talking to people that understand fruit trees and olive trees and vineyards. So they, they live in an agricultural you know, society, so they certainly understand this parable. He's talking to people in the know. And what's the basic line here? If you're going to bear much fruit, you're going to have to be pruned. And the Father is going to prune you. Even if you're bearing fruit, the Father's going to prune you some more, so you'll bear more fruit. And the, the rule of thumb with trees and fruit-bearing trees is the better you prune a tree, the more fruit it's going to produce. When a tree is not pruned, a fruit-bearing tree is not pruned, it will begin to reduce the amount of quality fruit. It may grow a lot of fruit, but it's probably going to end up wormy. It's apples, it's going to end up small, and it's going to spend a lot of time and energy on wasted things, wasted limbs, wasted branches that aren't going to produce fruit. One of the things I found about fruit trees is they seem to have a mind of their own. And I think we can gather a principle about this. You know, the nature of a tree, the nature of a tree, of any tree, and a fruit tree is no different than any other tree. If you leave it alone, what will it want to do? It will want to grow really tall. It'll shoot branches up into the air, and it will want to grow up, up, up toward the sun. But as a as a gardener, as somebody that owns an orchard, if you're an orchard keeper or a gardener, as Jesus called the Father, you don't want trees that are 20 feet tall for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, you're going to have a hard time picking fruit. You don't want to have to climb clear up a ladder 20 feet to get the fruit off the top of the tree. So the nature of fruit trees, if you've ever been by a, an older apple orchard, you'll notice that those apple trees tend to grow this way. They grow up and then they're this way. And uh, the reason is, is because they've been trained to grow that way. You know, and we learn some principles here. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15, it says, To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother 
is disgraced by an undisciplined child. The Passion Translation says it this way, experiencing many corrections or rebukes will make you wise, but if left to your own ways, you'll bring disgrace to your parents. We just saw a really interesting video by Larry Elders, who's a really interesting uh, guy that I've listened to a lot. And he talked about the importance of fathers. Here it is, Father's Day. We know the importance of fathers and how important it is for fathers to shape their sons, to shape their children. And we find that, uh, um, that there's great dire consequences when children are raised without fathers. And why? Because, and not that they don't need mothers as well, but we're talking about fathers day to day. But the reason is, is because children need to have their value shaped. Children need to be pointed in a direction. I said last week, you know, when, when our children are young, uh, basically parents are pre- predominantly, uh, you know, we are, we are dictators. Benevolent, loving dictators, like God is a dictator. But we basically call all the shots when they're little. We tell them what they can eat, where they can go. They have very little, if it, really they don't have any autonomy as children other than, you know, they can play around on the floor. We choose what they watch on television. We choose their friends. Uh, we choose what they're allowed to eat. So they really have complete dependence on us. And of course, what's our goal? Our goal is as they get older, they begin to make more choices. They get a little more autonomy. And our goal is to raise up our children with our values, with our moral compass that God has put within us. So they grow up to be godly and follow after our godly examples. And this is what Proverbs, this is what God told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6. God literally laid the responsibility for raising children, not in, the, not in the Sunday school, not on the church. He laid it in, and not in the government, he laid it on the parents. It's our responsibility as parents to shape our children. The reason we're having moral breakdowns and our, our society right now is suffering all the woes is because of the breakdown of the family. If you have a weak family, you're going to have a weak church. If you have a weak church, you're going to have a weak society. If you have a weak society, you're going to have a weak government. And if you have a weak government, you're going to have chaos. And this is what we're experiencing today in our nation. The real problem with our nation is moral rot. And the reason we have moral rot is because we have moral rot within our families. And uh, this, of course, we could go in a lot of detail about that. But what does the Bible say? It says that we have to discipline our children. We have to train them up. We have to not let them just do whatever they want to do. And, and so we learn this. And, and what does this have to do with pruning? Well, I find that trees are the same way. You can't just let a tree grow any way you want. So what do you do as a, when you own a tree and you begin to prune it? You're going to train that tree to grow a certain way. For instance, um, one of the methods of pruning trees is um, when trees grow up to a certain height, uh, one of the methods that w- people will use to prune it is you may have four or five long, tall branches that are sticking straight up in the air. One of the techniques that, that often pruners will use is they'll cut all of the branches up there about a foot to two feet below that tall branch, and then they'll take that tall branch and they'll bend it over and stake it to the ground. So what it does is it forces, that becomes the new top of the tree. And what you're really training that tree to do is you're training the tree to grow out instead of grow up. And so what we're really looking at when we're pruning trees is we're molding and shaping that tree to our will instead of its own will. And in this we get a real interesting picture because that's literally what God wants to do in our own lives. He doesn't want us to just grow independently. He doesn't want us to just have a will of our own where we do whatever we want to do and we grow whatever we want to grow. And really as a pruner, as somebody that owns an orchard, as somebody that owns a tree, if you've ever dealt with trees, you don't want that to happen either. Because it doesn't take very long for a tree, just a few months, and a tree will grow all sorts of branches in the weirdest places that really are never going to bear any good fruit, if any fruit at all. So a fruit fruit tree like children, has to be pruned. This is a good illustration. We are children of God, and God is going to prune our lives. And God wants to shape our lives so that we grow the way He wants us to grow instead of the way we want to grow. Uh, The nature of a fruit tree, as I said, they want to grow tall. And we have to train that tree to not grow tall, but to grow out. And um, the nature of the fall that came about in, in the Garden of Eden was that it brought with it an independent spirit. It brought with us, within us, put within the human being, this desire to have autonomy from God. You know, you heard people say, well, God helps those who help themselves. Well, the Bible doesn't really say that. 
And we realize that we are called to work hard and we have a responsibility to be vigilant and disciplined. We know that. But God wants us completely dependent upon him. That's a very difficult thing for us to get a hold of. God wants us to rely on him, not rely on our own wisdom. What does the Bible say in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your steps. So the God, God wants us to rely on him. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen? That's how God wants us to live. God wants us to be completely dependent upon him that we seek him daily, that we rely on him instead of relying on our own ingenuity. But there's, a, there's something within us that just, it's, we don't even have to try to do this. It just, it's just built within us. And whether we're a Christian or not, we still have to crucify our flesh. The Bible, Paul said, I crucify my flesh. I bring it into submission. I bring under my carnal appetites so that after I preach to others, I myself might not be disqualified for the course. And so the, the nature of the flesh, the nature of the carnal appetites with in human beings is to want to do our own thing and walk and grow in our own way. But that is not God's will for our lives. God's will is to shape us by His power, by His Spirit, by His Word to be conformed into His image, not our own image. Not an image we think. You know, the same thing's true with our children. Yes, we want our children to grow up to be, you know, they're going to have their own life. They're going to get married. They're going to leave home. The Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So the real goal of our children is when they grow up and they leave our homes, that they become autonomous from us. But no, no wise parent wants their kids to grow up. You know, I hear parents say things like this. Well, I just think children should be allowed to make their own choices. When they leave home... Because you want them to grow autonomy. But you don't want them to just make all their own choices. You know, as I said before, somebody asked me one day, uh, they said, what would you do if one of your sons came to you and they said, I'm gay? And I said, first of all, that's never going to happen. Because my sons are very confident in being men. And they have a good father. And see, when, when men have a good father figure in their life, they won't become gay. And when women have a good mother figure in their life, they won't become lesbians. Every single gay person, every single lesbian person on this planet, you go back to their childhood, you go back to their relationship with their father or their mother, it's either a bad relationship, it's no relationship, or something's wrong in that relationship. Without exception. I could just go down the list of people that I know and have known through the years that are gay. Every single one of them, they were either molested as a child or they had a, no father or they had a bad father figure. Because their identity is broken. And see, we as God's people, we draw our identity from God. But we also draw our identity from those around us. We draw our identity from older believers and we draw our identity from our parents. And we're going to become like our parents, good, bad, and ugly. Well, our goal is, the Bible says, children are like arrows in the quiver of a mighty man. What does that mean? You take your arrow, you put it in your bow, and you shoot it. In other words, our children should go further than we are. They should be smarter than we are. They should be more accomplished than we are. And they should be more godly than we are. They should go further spiritually. Amen? They shouldn't digress. But we know throughout Scripture that sometimes happens. You know, the Bible talks about there was a generation after Joshua and those, that generation died off that did not know the Lord. Well, why didn't they know the Lord? Well, something happened in the process where the Word of God, the, the reality of God was not transferred onto those children. So something was broken there. But in the same way, you know, the nature of human beings is we want to be autonomous. We want to have our own space. And, and again, I'm not talking about being a smothering parent, a helicopter mom or dad, as some people call them, or a parent that does not allow your children to grow up. We know that there are parents like that, that they just, you know, the, the child's kid's 21 years old, the mom and dad are making all their decisions. There's something wrong there. But on the other hand, if you look at the Bible... And this wasn't really meant to be a message on parenting, but uh, <laughs> I never know how these messages are going to turn out. I just start preaching and they go in directions. So, so if you look at the Bible, you see that in the Scripture, and especially in the Jewish culture, and throughout history, really, most cultures, the parents played a vital role in their children's lives even when they be, reach what we would call the age of adulthood. 
For instance, the idea that you go out and you choose your mate and you go date somebody and get married to them is really kind of an anomaly when you look at the world. I mean, if you go to India today, although India is much more independent and much more westernized, there's lots of parents that still choose your, your mate. In the Jewish community, you, they chose your mate. If you ever watched the movie Fiddler on the Roof, in mo- many cultures today, the children don't get the autonomy to choose who they marry. The parents choose. And you know why they choose? They choose because the parents, it's considered in most cultures, when you're older and grown up, you have more wisdom than your kids. And so you're going to choose. Now, it doesn't always work that way. What was the idea behind it? The idea is I'm going to choose a match for my son or my daughter that is going to benefit them. Now, we know there's distortions because human beings are fallen, and I'm not saying that's a perfect system. But I think we have to recognize that sometimes Western culture is a very young culture, and because it's young, and sometimes we don't, oper- we don't operate always the way God designed it, sometimes we have a lot of screwy pop culture things that have really hurt our families. Now, I'm not saying you can't grow up as a young person and get married and marry the person of your choice. I'm not suggesting that. But some people, when I look at them, they should have let their mom and dad choose who they married. (laughs) Amen? And you really never know. You really never know. You can't always tell, uh, you know, because people are people. But I'm simply pointing out something about the correlation here between kids and growing and our relationship with God and growing and trees. And that is that trees have to be shaped by the pruner and by the owner, the gardener of that tree, as we need to be shaped by God. We don't let the trees grow independently because what happens? If you let a tree grow independently, the tree will not grow in a way that's going to produce the most fruit. And what did Jesus say? If you abide in me, every branch in me my Father prunes. Every branch in me that bears fruit my Father prunes. Why do you prune a tree? Because Trees grow fruit from new growth. Every year, trees grow new. You know, if you look at a pine tree in your yard, even though it's not a fruit-bearing tree, look at a pine tree every year, they grow a new top, don't they? They grow new. You can just see the new growth grow onto that tree. Fruit trees the same way. And so when you prune a fruit tree, what happens is the tree will begin to grow another branch. It'll begin to grow new sprouts. Uh, You know, I pruned my trees this, this spring when they were still dormant. And, uh, you know, I went out just uh, last week. I looked at them, and uh, they're already growing all kinds of sprouts and shoots off of that tree. And what happens to a tree? Well, you find very quickly that as soon as you prune it, give it a few months, and it will begin growing right back and wanting to grow more. So it'll just grow all these what we commonly call sucker branches. Uh, One of the rules of thumb, if you have a branch coming out, you'll see these branches, these stems growing straight up in the air like this. And so you cut all those things off because they're not going to bear fruit. They're worthless. So there's a lot of things you find on a tree is it wants to grow a lot of worthless foliage. The nature of trees, you know, you might look at a tree like an oak tree, which is big and full of foliage, or a a basswood tree, or some type of tree like a, a mountain ash that's a beautiful shade tree, and it's got all sorts of foliage. But the rule of thumb for, for fruit-bearing trees is you don't want an overabundance of foliage. Because one of the things that foliage does is it can cause dead growth. And so what do you do? You want to, The rule of thumb in, in a tree, when you look at a tree, it's called a canopy. That's what the foliage of the tree is. And so the rule of thumb in pruning a tree is what you call an open canopy. And, what the, and when, when you think of this, it really represents the human heart. The Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. You may look at a tree and it looks beautiful, a fruit tree, and it's got all kinds of foliage, and you may say, man, that's a beautiful tree, but really it's not a beautiful tree because it's not going to be really good, a good fruit-bearing tree until you get rid of some of the foliage. And really, you have to be really drastic with that tree. You have to lop the tar out of it. Last year, I pruned some of my apple trees that hadn't been pruned for a full year, and I had big piles of branches Because what happens to the tree is the tree grows full of foliage. And you'll find that trees by nature, they'll grow branches that go back toward the center of the tree. Because the tree wants to just fill in all the spots with foliage. So what happens is when it gets too much foliage, it blocks the sun and it blocks the air from getting into the tree. Now, if you take, for instance, like a citrus tree, citrus trees are much more dense with foliage than like an apple tree or pear tree or something like that. And citrus trees, if you've ever looked at a 
huge citrus orchard. It's almost like a hedgerow of trees. And there's a couple ways they prune them. They prune them with mechanical machines that will go out. But those mechanical machines tend to only prune the outside. And so really to prune a citrus tree correctly, you have to get into the inside. Because citrus trees, because the, the foliage is so thick, they will literally call, create a dead zone in the middle of the tree. And when you cut the tree open, it'll be full of dead branches because it's not getting any sun down into the tree. And what happens when you get dead branches? Well, it's not going to grow fruit in there. And number two, it's going to be susceptible to wind damage. And number three, it's going to be susceptible to insect damage. So the idea of uh, pruning a tree is what you call an open canopy. And when you think about it, I really think it's an image God has given us of worship. Because what you want to do with the tree, I call it, you want to open the center of the tree. So you really want your branches, you want main branches, and you, when you walk up to that tree, like an apple tree, you want to be able to walk in, and here's the center. And you know what the center is full of? It's light, sun, and air. And this is kind of how the tree looks. What does that look in our lives? Open to God. Worshiping God. The light of Christ shining into our hearts. And see, this is the deal. God wants to deal with our hearts. But human beings, by nature, they want to keep God to the perimeters of their life. You know, you can deal with this out here, but I don't want you in here in this intimate place of my heart. As if we're hiding it from God. As if God can't see it. But we think that we're deceiving God. Really, we're just deceiving ourselves. But God wants to get into the innermost workings of your heart. God wants to get into the center of your being. And he wants to begin pruning the attitudes of your heart. He wants to begin pruning the, the motives of our heart. God weighs the motives. You know, the Bible says almost every man will declare his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find. What does that mean? Every man thinks that his ways are right in his own eyes. But God looks at the motives. God doesn't look at what you're doing. He looks at why you're doing it. You can do all the right things, but do them with the wrong heart. And they're wasted, worthless fruit. They're not going to hold the test of time. And this is what the Word of God says in Mark's Gospel, the ninth chapter, the 31st verse. Jesus sitting down with, Jesus called his twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. So what does this have to do? It has to do with a servant's heart. God wants us to have a servant's heart. We want fruit trees to have a servant's heart, so to speak. We don't want them to grow independently. We want them to serve their master. And that's us. God wants us to serve him, and he wants us to bear fruit. You know, God is a fruit inspector. God comes and looks at our lives, and he says, are you bearing any fruit? Well, if you're not bearing fruit, you need some pruning in your life. A lot of times Christians will grow to a point in their Christian life and they become frustrated. They become exacerbated about things and they start saying, well, you know, the problem is that church I'm going to, that pastor is just not preaching the Word of God. And sometimes that can be the problem. The problem is that wife I have or that husband I have. The problem is this thing. Really the problem is probably you. But it's easier to blame people. Well, if I just moved across the country, if I just got a new job, and sometimes that's, I'm not saying we can't do those things, and sometimes a change of pace can do us good, but the only problem with that attitude is wherever you go, there you are. And you have to change you, because you're going to be there a little while, and pretty soon you're going to come back. You're going to think, oh man, I've just reached utopia, and one day you're going to look in the mirror, and there you are, and you're the problem. But some people never grow beyond that. They just spend their whole life blaming somebody else. Well, I've been through three marriages. I've been through five marriages. And I don't know what's wrong with these people. But uh, <laughs> because there's an old adage, the way you leave is the way you enter. If you leave offended, you'll enter offended. You know, I've learned that as a church, as a pastor, the hard way over the years. I've had a lot of people come through our doors over the years. And... Uh, some of those people have come from offended situations from other churches. And, you know, I always like to say, well, go back and get that right before you come in here. And, and, and a lot of times over the years, I've witnessed people that are older Christians sometimes, and they've been in the Lord sometimes a long time. <clears throat> but the problem is they've never dealt with resolving things. And so eventually what's going to happen is there, that offense that's in their life is going to be pointed at you. It'll come back. It'll happen. I always say, you know, sometimes people think you're the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread until you flip that switch in their lives and, wow, I guess that's still in there. <laughs> 
but instead of let's deal with it and resolve it and get reconciliation, get restoration, and get this put to the knife, people just go on. And it doesn't help them. It doesn't help them grow. Am I being a little too real here this morning? <clears throat> um, no. This is just life. And whether it's a church or another situation or marriage or relationships, it's so easy to just ax people out of our life when really what we need to do is we need some pruning in ourselves. Sometimes God brings people into your life that are problematic to cause the, the real fruit to come out. Have you ever had people in your life that test your patience a lot? I've had to do a lot of repenting over the years because I've had people that test my patience and rub me the wrong way. And sometimes you can get a real sour attitude about people. You know, that's like I said, you know, ministry would be great if you didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> but life would be that way, right? Whether you're in the ministry or not. That job would be great if I didn't have that boss. My marriage would be great if I didn't have this woman or this man. But it's still, it has to do with the heart. And it's easier to look at other people and imagine they're the problem when really maybe it's my attitude. Maybe it's me. You know, maybe, maybe I've got some pruning God needs to do in my life and I'm not really allowing him to do that because I want to focus on this person over here and blame them. And I'm not saying that people can't be a problem. I'm not suggesting that. But the truth is, we need to let God deal with the heart. And this is what God de deals with. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, when, when Samuel was going to pick King David, God had sent him up to Jesse's house to pick King David. And remember, the first man, Saul, was chosen by the people by his outward stature and appearance, right? He was taller than everybody, and so they naturally thought, well, he'd be the prime candidate for the king. And what happened? Saul started out with a humble heart, but then he got into pride and arrogance and really shipwrecked his life because he wouldn't let God prune him. So <clears throat> Samuel goes to the Lord, and he's going up to anoint the next king, and he goes to the one son, and the Lord says, but to, said to Samuel, verse 7, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So this is what I'm talking about, about fruit trees. You may look at a tree, and you say, man, look at the beautiful limbs, and it's so pretty. But really, God says, that tree is never going to bear the fruit I want it to bear until I take care of it and cut off some of this stuff. See, sometimes <clears throat> our lives can look really good to people out here. I've found this over the years with people's lives, so, you know, I'm just being very real with you this morning. As a pastor, you know, in, in ministry, you see pretty much everything. Just when you think you've seen it all, you see something else. And one of the things <clears throat> I've definitely found over the years, excuse me, I've got to get a drink. <clears throat> one, of, one of the things I've definitely found over the years is that there are a lot of Americans that look really good on the outside, but they've, re they've got wrecked homes. They've got wrecked marriages. They've got everything under the sun. They've got material possessions, beautiful homes, beautiful appearances, but their home life and their marriage and their children are a wreck. That's all that foliage out here. Well, why is it a wreck? Because what happens to our lives, and none of us are exempt from this, is that when we are left to ourselves and we do not submit our hearts to God, we tend to start growing all this excessive baggage. We're growing things out here. We're, our hearts get led astray. We're involved with things that God never called us to be involved with. We've got commitments coming out of our ears. Americans... And American Christians are just as bad. We're, we're committed to a lot of things we shouldn't be committed to. We're involved with a lot of things we really have no business being involved with. <clears throat> you know, I've, I've realized this growing, our, growing children. I know, you know, having kids that went through school, and it seems like schools today are on public schools today because they're trying to be the parents because you have broken homes. So, parent, so public schools have taken on the posture of being the parents to children. And so public schools have this idea that you keep kids so busy with activities that that'll keep them out of trouble. Well, what I've found is many of those school activities invade family time. 
There's too many things kids are involved with. And if a kid goes off to college, they don't just want to look at your SAT score. They want to look at how many activities were you involved with. So you find kids, they're in this group, in this group, and they're in this sport, and this thing over here. They're running crazy. Well, that's not how life used to be in America. But it is how life is now. And so families are just, they're just spread so thin. And of course, that's why, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. That's why a lot of Christians don't attend church anymore. Because the average church attendance in America now is between one and two weeks a year, a month. That's considered full-time church attendance pretty much across the board in any size church of an America you look at. And why is that? Because people's lives are spread too thin. And why are their lives spread too thin? Because they got a lot of foliage growing. They got a lot of foliage. And the first thing that tends to get cut in people's lives nowadays is not the basketball team or the football team or the wrestling team or, or the swim team or the forensics or whatever the case may be. It's church and it's God. Well, we, we want to be church, but we just don't have time. And, you know, my wife and I, we've, we've looked at this, and, and you guys are here, so I'm preaching at the choir this morning. And I'm not preaching at people that aren't here this morning. So, but, but, you know, as a pastor, what did Paul tell, the Tim, to, to tell Timothy? Rebuke, reprove, correct, instruct in righteousness. So I'm giving you some reprove, rebuke, uh, instruction in righteousness. I'm being a pastor this morning. Is that okay? Yeah. You know what a pastor's like? A pastor's like a dad. Because the church is structured after the home. And you know what a dad does? The dad disciplines his kids. Now, moms discipline their kids. I saw somebody put on Facebook, um, I survived uh, wooden spoons. Uh, <laughs> the old adage is moms use wooden spoons on their kids to spank them. My mom never did that. Amen. My mom used a wooden broom. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> She was small, and she had four boys, so. <laughs> I did see her throw rocks at my brother one time. <laughs> he ran away from her, and she couldn't catch so She picked up. <laughs> yeah. I don't think she hit him, but it was funny. <laughs> but the point is, the point is in our lives, we need correction. And we need people to speak into our lives to bring correction. You know, one of the problems, I think, in the American church, we're a mile wide and an inch deep, and we have very little accountability to anybody. And the American mindset, while independent and good, is not necessarily always godly. Because that great American independence can always ca also cause us to be prideful, where we will not receive correction from but somebody. You know, where the idea is like, who are you to tell me what to do? That's a proudful attitude. Now, I'm just like you. If somebody comes and gets in my face and starts rebuking me, my nature is, you know, like I'm a banty rooster. You know, I want to fight. But we need to allow people to correct us. I remember Joyce Meyer's talking about this, Meyer talking about this one time, and I thought, but this is really good. She said, you know, I'm, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I remember she said, when I was a young Christian, I was involved in a church ministry, and the pastor's wife came to me one time and said, you know, Joyce, you do so many things, but you do them for the wrong reason. And she said, I was mad, got mad. <laughs> but she said, I thought about it, and she said, you're absolutely right. We can do a lot of good things, but do them for the wrong reasons. And we need people. We need, we need our brothers and sisters. And we need to have a relationship that is strong enough where if somebody confronts us with what's going on in our lives, that we're humble enough to receive correction from somebody. Now, that's easier said than done. Believe me. But what a lot of times people do is they get confronted with something and they become offended. And instead of receiving correction, they cut that thing off of their life. See, that's the wrong kind of pruning. That's human pruning. And so uh, what God wants to do is he wants to deal with our heart. He wants to correct our heart. He wants to correct the heart of the human person. Now, let me back up the ship here. You know, if you guys go somewhere and you're gone on Sunday, I'm not calling you the devil or anything like that. People miss church. That's fine. 
That's why you know I'm talking about something, a systemic problem that's beyond just that. That's what I'm talking about. When we get, get in the habit, you know, I, I, I realize that going to church becomes a habit, not going to church becomes a habit. And we live in a culture today, and I'm on this soapbox a lot because I hear a lot of people saying, well, the church needs to change, and we need to be an online church. Fooey. That's nonsense. That's modern myth. The church has survived doing what we're doing for 2,000 years, and we've changed nations. We don't need to just be on the Internet because people have bought into this secular hype that, well, you can do church on the Internet. How many of you found out when we were shut down during COVID, it was not the same? For one thing, I can't really see you. You can't see me. It's not the same at all. We are organic members. We need one another. We need interaction. God designed us to put ourselves into a body, and a body can't function on an Internet web server. It's not the same at all. That's simply a tool. It's a good tool, but it's simply a tool, and it cannot replace what we do here. Even if we were the underground church, you know, even the underground church in China, they still meet together. They desire to be together. And one of the things I heard people say to me, like, oh, I miss my church family. I miss being together with people. Of course we do. We're designed to be together. You don't see one branch. If you see a branch lopped off the tree laying on the ground, it's a dead branch. So as God begins to mold and shape us, God wants to open our heart just like we want to open the center of that tree so the light of Christ, the light can shine into our lives and the, the air can get into us because that way we can begin growing. And the reason we do that with trees is that way the whole canopy gets light. It gets light down in there. And we can access any part of the branch. We can access the fruit. We can walk up to the tree and pick the fruit. It becomes accessible. And in the same way, God wants our hearts to be open so he has access into our lives. He's not having to deal with a bunch of foliage to try to get to the real us. I heard one pruner say, when I walk up to a tree, I don't want to have to fight my way into the center of that tree. I want to be able to just walk into that tree. I thought, that's good advice. Think of that relationship. Are our lives open enough where somebody could just walk into our lives and speak into our hearts? Or do we have a problem with intimacy? Now, intimacy is not, I'm not talking about sexual intimacy. I'm talking about intimacy meaning the heart. And a lot of men, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a very open type of person. My wife and I have a very open relationship. But I, I, there's times in my life I struggle with intimacy. Men struggle much more with intimacy than women do because women tend to be much more in tune with their emotions than men do. Men are much more logic-wired. And so for a woman to say, I love you, they're just, you know, when I met my wife, her, her sisters, her sisters, her family is much more the huggy, kissy kind of family. I grew up with four, three brothers, three brothers in Med Midwestern Wisconsin. You know, in the old, <laughs> if you've ever read the book, How to Speak Minnesotan, you ought to read that book because it just depicts this culture, because it's a Scandinavian culture, German, the Scandinavian German, uh, you know, the Scandinavian culture uh, where the Midwestern, that culture is much more reserved. You know, when we moved down south to Tulsa when I went to Bible school, we were kind of taken back by the culture because Southerners are just more exuberant than Midwesterners are. You know, you walk into a store, hi, honey. You know, Hi, sweetheart. If you walked into a store and some person called you sweetheart in Wisconsin, it's like, you want to smack upside the kisser or what? <laughs> you just don't hear that up here. People are just more, more demonstrative in the South, much more demonstrative. And I always say it's because it's warm down there. We're, we're Northerners, we're so cold all the time. We got two weeks of summer, so we spend all of our energy keeping warm. But there is a difference between cultures. We recognize that. And so growing up in that, you know, the old adage is in the book, How to Talk Minnesota, and you have two brothers that haven't seen each other for three years. They drive, one brother drives into the car, gets out of the car, and says, so you get a new car? That's called a Midwestern greeting right there. So 
being from that culture, and this isn't only Midwesterners, but there is a thing with men that men oftentimes have a very difficult time engaging their emotions when it comes to intimacy. You know, it's off, you know, the old adage, my father never told me he loved me. Why didn't he tell? Because his father never told him he loved him. You know, you hear stories like, my father loved me, but he never said it, but I knew he loved me. Or you hear women say, well, my husband just, he doesn't meet my emotional needs. And most men like, I bring a paycheck home. I buy you the things you need. Because, see, that's the way men's brains are tend to be wired. We can't understand sometimes that the people are not just machinery. They need human engagement. Right? Now, that's very uncomfortable sometimes for men. You know, like my wife, her family is, you know, very, very demonstrative. Her, you know, women tend to be that way. And her family, her sisters, and I like that. I, I thought it was really refreshing because my, my brothers, you know, we're, we're boys. We're men. We don't touch each other and, you know, get away from me. <laughs> men aren't, you know, men aren't wired that way. And a lot of men really aren't wired that way. And so it was a little bit of a challenge, but... It, my wife has, always, has been very good in bringing that out of me because I've, I've become much more of an extrovert person since meeting her because she really was good at drawing that out of me. But there's still times in my life that I have, even with my wife, hard times expressing myself just you know, like she will. And uh, I think it has to do with the way our hearts are wired. You know, our hearts... And God wants, wants that intimacy. He wants to be able to access points in our heart. He wants to be able to get into our hearts. And as men, guys, he wants to be able to get into our hearts and deal with the hurts and wounds in our hearts. And women the same way. You know, for instance, let me just give you the... the and again, I didn't intend this to be a marriage seminar and a child-raising seminar this morning, but... Uh, I've noticed over the years as a pastor... We've had different speakers in over the years. I remember one particular speaker we had in once, and they did an altar call for, for people who had been wounded in their lives, and they had emotional scars. And interestingly enough, whenever I've seen that over the years, like you need inner healing or something like that, what we commonly call inner healing, which, you know, we need emotional problems. And, you know, Jesus said he's the, binds up the brokenhearted. But one of the things I've often seen if you watch this is that almost the entire altar call will be filled with women. Why? Because women understand. Women are in touch with their emotional things. Women just seem to engage with. You know, it's like, for instance, if you have a women's ministry meeting... You'll, women will spend a lot of time praying over women with emotional scars and wounds. And I'm not saying those aren't real scars and wounds. But I've never been to, a, I've only been to a handful of men's ministry meetings over the years where there's an altar call full of men that were praying over their emotional scars and wounds. Why is that? Because men have a hard time opening their hearts. Gary Smalley used to talk about people with a closed heart versus an open heart. He said, when you abuse somebody or you wound somebody or offend somebody, you close their heart to you. What does that mean? They shut you off emotionally. He spoke about this husband and wife that came, this wife that came to him one day for counseling. And uh, I can't remember the whole situation, but she wanted, he wanted to talk to her about her husband. She said, well, what about your husband? She, she was going to leave him. And he said, uh, I can't stand him. I can't even stand to be in the same room with him. I just despise him. He's so mean and abusive and blah, 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 all this stuff. And, and he started prodding a little bit. Well, well what, what was he like that he got? And, uh, and he kind of got her. And she, now you're getting me to talk about him. I don't want to talk about him. Well, you see what happens with people. How, how is it that two couples, two people that are madly in love and can't stand to be away from each other for more than five seconds and they're just madly in love within a few years, sometimes even a few months after living together, they can't even stand to be in the same room with each other? What's happened there? Wounding, hurting, abuse. 
So the difference is with God, God doesn't want to wound people. God wants to cure people. God wants to heal people. And so the, the pruning God is going to do in our lives, it may, the Bible says no discipline for the moment seems pleasant, but it brings forth an eternal reward. You know, as a child, no child enjoys discipline from their parents. No adult enjoys to be disciplined. How many of you have worked on a job and your boss chews your keister out? You don't enjoy it. It's, none is, is profitable, but, but somebody that has the best intention in mind, you think of people in the military, uh, when people join the military, they do things to people to get them to conform and be disciplined that sometimes doesn't make a bit of sense to the people at the moment, and they don't enjoy it, but looking back at their lives, what does it intend to do? It's intended to get them to conform to a set of standards, so that when you say, do this, you do it. And oftentimes in our lives with God, God is trying to conform us to his standard and he doesn't want a bunch of questions and why should I do this? But when we open our heart to God and allow him to get into the innermost working of our soul, innermost working of our conscience, then he can begin to prune away those dead limbs. Maybe that's wounds from your past, past where you don't trust anybody anymore. There are people that have a root of bitterness where they're bitter at the whole world or people that have been wounded by, by maybe an abusive parent or abusive spouse or abusive relationships and they don't trust anybody anymore. Well, somebody said, you know, I remember talking to a lady years ago who had been in a, an abusive relationship and the Lord told me, tell her this, the same door you keep shut to keep pain out is the same door you have to open to let God in. The same door that keeps pain out and fear out is the same door you have to open to let love in. See, some people, they're hard to love because they're so wounded and their hearts are shut. They're a closed heart. And so God wants to open your heart to him. You know, I was talking about this. We're talking about Father's Day today. Father's Day. There's 20, over around 30 million American, probably much more than this. This was several years ago. Uh, there were somewhere along 30 million American people today, boys. Talking about boys, I don't know about girls, but 30-some million American boys that are raised with absolutely no father figure in their life at all. Not a father in the home and not a father figure. So a lot of people, and then we think of all the things going on in, in the world today with sex trafficking and, you know, children being abused by even their parents sexually. So a lot of people have no concept of what a father is. They have no concept of what a loving father is. So when we talk about a father, God's a good, good father, a lot of people don't even know what that is. As a matter of fact, I was, I was at a meeting a few years ago with um, a, a lady who's the head of the Wisconsin Family Council. I can't think of her name. Uh, Julia Appling, I think is her name. And she does a lot of ministry to inner city kids down in Chicago, in this, or not Chicago, but in Milwaukee, in the school systems there. And one day she was talking to these kids, and uh, they happened to see this ring on her finger. And this one girl says, what's that bling on your finger? And she said, well, that's my wedding ring. She said, wedding ring? What's that? What's a wedding ring? And she said, you know, when people get married, she said, what are you talking about? This girl, they didn't even know what marriage was. <laughs> And she said, I had to literally train them and teach them about marriage because they didn't know what it was. Well, that's a broken world, folks. And that's the world a lot of people are growing up in today. And that's why we're seeing the trouble we're seeing in our society today because people are broken and hurt and wound. And hurting people hurt other people. It's just the way it is. But God wants to heal our hearts. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 through 35, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So the human heart is the issue here. And if we're going to bear godly fruit, we have to have a godly heart. And so God wants to deal with the heart it's the heart of people. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. 
People apart from God, their heart is full of all sorts of things. And so the propensity, again, as we wrap this up, the propensity is to want to deal with the external, to deal with what we look like, to deal with what people see. But God is dealing with the heart. And in our Christian life, God wants to deal with our heart. Look at this scripture. We're going to wrap this up in Matthew chapter 15, verse 10 through 20. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand now what not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, uh, but what comes, oh, oh, excuse me, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came to him and said, do you not know, do you know what, that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Verse 13, but he answered and said, every plant which he, my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone, they are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, they both fall into a ditch. Verse 15, then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not un yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So what do we see? We see this throughout the Word of God. It's a precept, it's a, it's a principle in the Word of God about the heart. It's not what goes into your heart, it's what comes out of the heart. So what God is wanting to deal with is our heart. Fruit produced comes out of the heart. It's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. It's out of our hearts that God wants to deal with our lives. And so in the same way, just like with a fruit tree, we prune that tree so that its heart becomes open, so the light can shine into it, so that the wind can get into it, so that we can keep the dead growth, the growth that really isn't going to produce fruit. We keep that pruned off. So eventually what happens, the tree is spending all of its energies and all of its efforts and all of its resources on fruit. Now, the interesting thing about fruit trees, like an apple tree, for instance, you know, I learned this from my good friend Steve over here. Uh, you'll, you'll get an apple tree and it'll have a cluster of, you know, five, six apples growing together. But even those you have to prune out. So what does that tell us? You know, the Bible says that... Um, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You ever thought about that, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? We can bear fruit in areas that really isn't the perfect will of God. We can be doing things that are good things, but they're not the best things. It's never wrong to do good. But just because somebody else is doing good doesn't mean you're called to do that good too. We need to do what's best in our lives. We need to do what God's called us to do. We're not called to run somebody else's race. You're not called to run my race. I'm not called to run your race. You're called to run your race. Now, when our races converge, we help each other. We understand that. We're joined together. We get that. But even with good fruit, you have to thin the fruit out. Because what do you want the tree to do? You want the tree to spend all of its energy and all of its resources in producing the best fruit. What did Jesus say? Every branch of me that bears fruit, my father prunes. What does he prune? He prunes the buds, he prunes the limbs, and he prunes the fruit so that it will, brew, it will grow the optimal fruit. So that's what we're, our goal is in a fruit tree. We have to prune the tree, we have to protect the tree because we have to spray it to keep the insects away, but we have to, and we have to thin the fruit on the tree. And when we do that, the tree will grow fruit. The tree will grow luscious fruit. The tree will grow optimal fruit. Because when we're growing the optimal fruit, it's because our lives are free from b the stuff that's dragging us down. So the truth is, in our lives, we need to be pruned regularly. We need to have attitudes pruned. We need to evaluate the way we're spending our time. We need to evaluate, uh, you know, our, our priorities. What's our, what's our priority? What are our priorities in our life? We need to evaluate those things. Now, that's not always easy to do. This is a very complex society, right? And you might be in a season in your life right now where you're really being spread thin. And, and there might be season in your, there's going to be seasons in your life where, where, where man, it's just like I'm, I'm just spread thin like, you know, too much butter over bread, so to speak. 
And, and sometimes uh, that doesn't mean you're not in the will of God. It just means that we need to make sure that we don't spend our whole lives there. That we're always evaluating and judging ourselves. You know, we had communion this morning. What does the Bible say about communion? If we would judge ourselves, we would not need to be judged. But when we are judged, we're corrected or chastened by the Lord so that we're not condemned with the world. So one of the things we do during communion, what we call communion, one of the things we should do is we always examine ourselves, judge ourselves. Lord, is my life right with you? That's the reason communion is considered a very sovereign time. It's a time of self-evaluation, self-examination. Socrates said, the unexamined life is a life not, fit worth, not worth living. So what God is saying here is he wants us to prune our, allow him to prune our lives, which means take an inventory of our hearts, take an inventory of our attitudes. You might be in a season right now where you're stretched to the max and you're, you're kind of in that season. And there are things that come into our life. It's kind of like the John Lennon song, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. A lot of life is like that. There's no perfect life. There's no such thing as ideal situations. They're not like, well, well, one day everything, the moon and stars will align and everything will be perfect. I've never seen anybody's life like that. And all the hype you hear on these YouTube commercials, like if you do this thing, your life's going to be just the most fantastic life. Maybe. But you're not that person. And if something's too good to be true, it probably is. If something's too easy, it probably is. Because a lot of stuff you hear in America is a bunch of hype to take your money and waste your time. You have a, run, a race to run for God yourself. You need to, we, we need to make sure that we're examining our, in our own lives. Self-evaluation is one of the most healthy things we can have in our lives. And that's basically what this message is about, is just... Allowing God to evaluate ourselves. To God, search me, O Lord, to see if there's any secret sin in my life. Search me, O Lord, do I have blind spots in my life? What attitudes, what behaviors, what things am I allowing that I haven't been willing to put the ax to? Well, if you let that grow, it's going to grow into a big old branch sticking out of your life. It's going to waste a lot of time and energy. And the last thing we want to do when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on that day is have him have to lop limbs off of our tree. <laughs> Say, well, this thing you were involved with over here was such a big deal. Sorry. That's not getting into the kingdom. This thing over here, you spent a lot of time and energy. That one's coming off too. We don't want to end up with one branch making it into the kingdom. You know, the Bible says some will be saved but as for fire. That means everything they've done in this life is going to get burnt up under the judgment of God. They'll get into the kingdom, but they're not going to have any fruit to show for it. Man, I don't want to be in that position. Well, how do we keep from being in that position? By examining our hearts, by letting God judge us and let God prune us. Well, if, if you feel like you've been limbed this morning, it'll grow back. God will heal it. Amen. <laughs> so this is a pruning message. So uh, sometimes pruning can be painful. But it's because God loves you and because I love you. Amen? Amen. And we love each other. Remember, if I, if I point a finger at you, four pointing back at me. So it's, or three pointing back at me. But it's harder on me than it is you. So, amen. It's kind of like the parents going to whip their son and said, you know, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it hurts you. And you know, it's like, yeah, it doesn't seem that way. Amen? So, <laughs> well, let's pray.